Hank, congratulations on 300 episodes. That's a fabulous achievement. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Robert J. Sawyer. Before we get into our great interview today, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House is one of the very best editors I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Crystal offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's booking for March right now, so inquire early. Go ahead and send her uh, an email. She has four proofreaders on staff, uh, so she can usually accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time. Uh, she comes highly recommended by authors such as Hugh Howie and Samuel Peralta. Most of her experiences with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle grade fantasy, but uh, you know, she's a master of all, so uh, be sure to reach out to her. Also, she's got something cool. She's uh, uh, currently recruiting for her Net Galley co op. Uh, authors who have new book releases or have old books that could use some review love can rent one, six, or 12 month slots and put up to a book a month on NetGalley's catalog, which now has its own dedicated United Kingdom site. So uh, check out the link in the show notes uh, to Pico's House. There's an awesome new anthology out from my friend Armand Rosamilia. It's called My Favorite Story Podcast Author Anthology. Project Entertainment Network presents My Favorite Story. Fifteen podcast hosts and authors share their favorite short stories they've ever written. Stories by Christopher Golden, Brian King, James A. Moore, Jay Wilburn, Chuck Buddha, Armand Rosamilia, and more. Check out this collection of stories presented by podcast hosts and authors. You're going to love this. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, check out my friend Daniel Kenny, who writes some of the very best middle grade uh, fiction if you're looking for the perfect gift for those younger readers, Dan is he's an amazing writer. Uh, he's been on the show before and uh, he's hilarious and he writes books that really grab kids' attention. Uh, he, I can't say enough wonderful things about Dan Kinney. There's a link down in the show notes. We're going to be talking more specifically about some of his books in the coming shows, but you're going to love Daniel Kinney. Go pick up some of his uh, middle grade readers for those uh, youngsters in your life. Also, Patricia Gilliam, she's one of my favorite science fiction writers. Uh, Patricia does amazing things. Um, There's a link down in the show notes where you can go visit her author page. She has a long-running series. If you're looking to get into some great new science fiction reading in the new year, you cannot go wrong with picking up some from Patricia Gilliam. As always, we have an audiobook clip at the end of the show from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Green series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today is episode 300 of the Author Stories Podcast, uh, four years in the making, uh, over 300 author interviews. And today I'm really excited to have Robert J. Sawyer, one of my favorite science fiction writers, uh, on the show with me. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you so much, Hank. I'm delighted to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, Before we get into talking about your amazing uh, writing career and uh, all of the great writing wisdom that I know you have to share with us, uh, we begin with the same question each show. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, most writers only very vaguely come to the notion that they might be a writer themselves after reading for a great length of time. I was an aberration. When I was 12 or so, my older brother Peter gave me a hand-me-down science fiction book. It was called Trouble on Titan by Alan E. Nurse is how it's pronounced, N-O-U-R-S-E, Alan E. Nurse. And it began, it had an introduction called I've never been there, about the joys of being a science fiction writer. So when I first, before I read, this was my first science fiction book, but before I'd even read the book, somebody was telling me how much fun it was 
to be a writer of science fiction. And lo and behold, I loved the book uh, and had already been loving science fiction on TV and the Star Trek and so forth. And so I knew right from the outset that this guy, it was an invitation. He said, you can write this stuff too. And indeed, it was a dream that I pursued pretty relentlessly until I made it a reality. Wow. Um, were you a uh, a kid that was intrigued by science um, before then? Like, um, yes. I, I, so, uh, so this was this was not a stretch uh, to have this kind of uh, awakened in your imagination. I, I already I am intrigued with how the world works and 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 imagining that. And now I can tell stories about it. That, that's a, a pretty cool yes. thing. You know, I was born in 1960, so the background of my life in the news was the uh, the space race, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs uh, to get, you know, the first uh, humans on the moon. And that was a heady time to be alive in terms of excitement about science and technology. And I was also, as I think many uh, young boys are, I was fascinated by dinosaurs, and it's a fascination I never gave up. I'm still very much a paleontology buff. But uh, I was interested in the ancient past. I was interested in the future. I was interested in space. My dad bought me a telescope. I was doing, you know, looking at the moons of Jupiter from my lawn, that sort of thing. So absolutely, yes, I was captivated by science from uh, from being a preschooler. I remember my dad reading books about dinosaurs and about nature to me. Uh, where, t- tell me about your parents. What sort of career were they in, and did they share their love of of reading with you? Absolutely. They were both academics. My father taught uh, economics at the University of Toronto, and my mother taught statistics at the University of Toronto. My mother had been a bona fide child prodigy. She graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, at age 17 with a bachelor's degree in commerce. She was the only woman in her class way back then in, what would that have been, around about 1940, I guess. Uh, And um, my father, not a prodigy, but a very bright man, uh, was they were both avid readers, particularly my dad. In fact, the sad thing for my dad now at 95 is age-related macular degeneration, and he can't read the way he used to anymore. It was such a cornerstone of his life, and he certainly passed that on to me. It's absolutely, my life is built entirely around written, uh, writing words and reading words that others have written. Would you consider um, the the household that you grew up in to be creative? Uh, you know, when you, when you think of economists, and uh, you don't necessarily think super creative people, but that's I think right. that's a that's right. But, but I think that's a a, a disservice to um, uh, to to people that think that way uh, in a lot of ways. Well, you know, my parents were sophisticated in the sense that they appreciated art. My dad liked classical music uh, and theater and so forth, but they. Neither my mother nor my father were actually creative people. And my two brothers, one older, one younger, both went and worked in the computing industry. And, you know, certainly there's an art to being a good programmer and system analyst, but it is not what people would think of as one of the traditional arts. I was the oddball in the family who really wanted to create things out of nothing. Uh, My family certainly... Uh, you know, they weren't Philistines. They were supportive of the arts, but they weren't. It was not an artistic family. Gotcha. Um, you, you grew up in Toronto, uh, right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, Toronto has a great uh, tradition of uh, of science fiction, and it, you a, a lot of um, you really think of Toronto as kind of a, a forward moving city, and um, with a great kind of geeky subculture. Uh, was that true when you were a kid? It became that in the 70s, and I was a kid for the first decade in the 60s. So uh, I was there when this was really happening. We had um, the first science fiction conventions in Toronto in the 1970s. Uh, The first science fiction clubs, I ended up being moderator of the Ontario Science Fiction Club in 1982. It had started in the late 70s. So it was emerging around the time that uh, I was a teenager, and that was great because it was my culture. I uh, founded my high school science fiction club with a friend when I was 15. And that was the cornerstone of my social life, absolutely, through high school. Wow. 
Um, so the the book uh, by Nurse uh, really kind of opened your eyes to the fact that that you could be a science fiction writer. Um, what were some of the first things that you started writing? Well, it's funny because I mentioned I was interested in paleontology. So a lot of my early stuff was time travel. I, I think everybody who was fascinated by dinosaurs shares that fantasy of someday actually having seen them in the flesh. Nobody was thinking along the lines that Michael Crichton did a couple of decades later of cloning them at that time. The only possible scenario, if possible in, in scare quotes, was time travel. So I uh, definitely was writing stories that uh, dealt with going back in time and also adventure stories. I was a big fan of uh, Roy Chapman Andrews. He's the real life counterpart of uh, Harrison Ford. The char- That's right. Aaron Ford, the character, was based on uh, um, Indiana Jones, was based on Roy Chapman Andrews. Now, later in life, I discovered that Andrews, like many people who were born late in the century before the century before this one, was a racist and so forth. Uh, But at the time when I was a kid reading his books about his adventures as a paleontologist in uh, in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, um, I was writing stuff. Uh, paleontological adventure stories, too, which didn't really have a science fictional component, except that they were fiction about scientists. Well, and and some, uh, you know, there, there's these great um, uh, kind of uh, separations in science fiction, and it's it's really a broad umbrella. Uh, the way we talk about adventure stories, we talk about hard science, we talk about futurist stories, and uh, we talk about time travel. It's really a broad umbrella with a lot of room to explore, um, I, I kind of like that it's a broad umbrella, and and that uh, because there's so much more to science than, oh, yes. than, than one discipline, <laughs> uh, and there ought to be more to science fiction than just one particular discipline. Well, I have two answers. The first is you're absolutely right. It is such a broad umbrella. People will sometimes say to me, people who don't read and, and are ignorant of science fiction, will sometimes say to me, well, don't you want to branch out? Don't you want to write something else? And I say no. And the reason is, under that broad umbrella, I've been able to do every kind of story. I've written science fiction as romance, my novel Rollback. I've written science fiction as social commentary, my novel Quantum Night. I've written science fiction as adventure, my novel Farseer. I've written science fiction as mystery, my novel Red Planet Blues. Whereas if I was an adventure writer, a romance writer, a mystery writer, uh, or what have you, I would be stuck writing, very likely if I was a mystery writer, I might have just as easily done 23 novels, the number I've done as a science fiction writer, but they'd all be about the same character, my detective character. That's a rut. Writing science fiction is anything but being in a rut. The second thing you said is there's science is so broad, and the thing that I love about science fiction is the way different scientific disciplines can come together in a fashion in which they normally would not, even on a university campus. So, for instance, Hominids, my novel that won the Hugo Award, has paleoanthropology and quantum physics. Well, the the professors who are in those two disciplines at a university probably don't even know each other. But in science fiction, you get to bring disparate Uh, fields of thought together, plus philosophy, plus history, plus gender studies, plus ecology, plus whatever you have, and see them spark off each other and generate uh, really new ideas out of the interaction, the interdisciplinary nature of the beast. And that's the number one thing I love about writing science fiction. And and one thing, Robert, that has really uh, always kind of endeared me to your writing is that uh, you, for the most part, uh, tend to look write science fiction that is um, uh, how how shall I say it um, hopeful uh, or mm-hmm. uh, maybe uh, I, I don't want to say utopian because that's not the right word necessarily, but definitely not dystopian. Uh, and and you mentioned Michael Crichton earlier when you're talking about paleontology um, and. You know, a, kind of a, a stark contrast between your writing and, and some of the things that, that Michael did is that he would see uh, a a piece of technology or a scientific discovery and automatically go to why this should never happen. Yes. <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head, Hank. I, you know, my agent uh, until about five years ago when he passed away 
was Ralph Vichinanza. Now, Ralph was also Stephen King's agent. So he had the power to move in that stratospheric level of New York Times bestselling publishing that was also occupied by Crichton. And I said to Ralph, Ralph, baby, come on. How come you don't get me the same kinds of deals that Crichton's agent gets for him? And he said, I can get you those deals, but you've got to write what Crichton writes. Crichton is an anti science fiction writer. He writes about the downsides of technology. He writes about we were better off before we knew how to clone or do nanotechnology or genetic engineering or what or artificial intelligence. You take your pick of his novels. And of course I did not want to do that. I am I don't think a mindless booster, but I think anybody I live in Canada where you know the climate would kill you if it were not for technology keeping us warm, keeping us sheltered, getting our vehicles moving through the ice. Anybody who has indoor plumbing should be grateful for science and technology and indoor lighting. But there's still this incredible backlash that is way more popular for people to say, oh, those scientists are messing with things that should be left alone. And I just could not subscribe to that philosophy. And Crichton did, and he type, tapped into a really paranoid retrograde uh, part of Western, uh, the Western zeitgeist. Well, it's a it's a really weird thing uh, because I have some some writer friends who are whom I dearly love, and uh, I, I think they're some of the best people in the whole world. But we just see the world differently. Uh, when I see something, I, I look at, uh, at at the at the bright side of it and how how you know that the world is is getting better. Yes. Um, you know, not necessarily through rose colored glasses, uh, obviously. Um, but I just don't uh, automatically go to you know burn the village down. That's just not my default. And 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 I guess thank God that we're that we're all different, you know, because uh, I think we do need a good dystopian story every now and then. Uh, you know, we need a a 1984 or a Fahrenheit 451. Um, but then we also need to think about what what we as humans are doing good and how we are pushing the the human narrative forward. Well, you know, it's interesting about the dystopias that you mentioned, because absolutely 1984, an important novel, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, or as we call it up here in Canada, Celsius 233, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. These are important books. These are books that said, here is a trend. It was uh, the trend towards totalitarianism. In 1984, for instance, here is a trend that we can nip in the bud if we act quickly. A trend towards censorship in Fahrenheit 451. A trend towards uh, men marginalizing women and taking control of their reproductive biology. Handmaid's Tale. But these were warning cries to say, let's do something about this. We don't want this future to come true. As Ray Bradbury said, my job, Ray Bradbury said, my job, Ray, is not to predict the future it's, it's to prevent, to prevent, it. to prevent yeah. the future exactly right. now what we have now is the dystopias like hunger games and divergent and so forth that take as a given that our our western society is going to collapse it's not a cautionary tale so much of what's being written particularly in the ya the young adult marketplace takes as a given that this civilization is is doomed so they're not cautionary, and I don't really understand the appeal. When you read any of those works we mentioned, any of those classic dystopias, you're incensed, and you get involved with politics, you get involved with grassroots movements, you speak to your elected representatives, you talk to people and say, look, man, we got to do something about this. When you read a modern day dystopia, you say, yeah, well, you know, it's hell in a handbasket. What are you going to do? We're doomed to, uh, to face this. And I don't think they're healthy in the way that the, the dystopias you spoke of were. Yeah, I, I've been going back and reading um, a good bit of, uh, uh, and air quotes here, classic sci-fi or golden age science fiction, a lot of Asimov, Clark, uh, Ray Bradbury, who... Uh, you know, we could argue is a science fiction author or not, um, but there there just seemed to be a different tone uh, in a lot of those stories. And and yeah, I, I have teenagers at home, and there's a lot of dystopia that comes through our house, and I just I don't get it. I don't. I when I was their age, 
um, even though I was a, a teenager in the Cold War and, and uh, you know, coming up with the, the, the Soviet threat always over our head, um, I turned to science fiction because I wanted to think about where we might be when we've gotten over this um, this love affair with, with violence and war and, and all that sort of stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I hope that uh, I, I hope to see a, a kind of a resurgence of hopeful science fiction again, um, a, as you who who, mo- who move much more uh, closely in the in the deep science fiction uh, 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 community than I do. Do you see a, a trend uh, moving forward with how uh, science fiction is, is progressing? Well, I write hopeful science fiction most of the time. I'm an optimist about uh, humanity, and I do believe, uh, not as an act of faith, but I think it's demonstrably provable that the human condition is getting better. If you want a nonfiction book on that topic, Stephen Pinker's bestseller from a couple of years ago, The Better Angels of Our Nature, is a very good uh, survey of how violence is down, uh, tolerance is up. You know, it, it's it well worth reading. I think we are getting better, but science fiction, uh, there isn't an awful lot of positive stuff. There's me, there's Kim Stanley Robinson, my colleague and friend. Uh, There's uh, Star Trek most of the time, although Star Trek Discovery at the moment is looking pretty dark. Um, But mostly, no, we've we've fallen into an awful lot of science fiction being mindless military uh, action adventure shading into war porn. And I must say it doesn't impress me at all. Uh, yeah, that that's a uh, that definitely seems to be what is popular right now. What is selling? Uh, mm-hmm. if, if you really want to uh, write to market and have a, uh, a a very successful series, that seems to be the place to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I understand that it's action, it's adventure. Um, it's just that I think that science fiction is capable of more. It's capable of changing the world when it's taken seriously by its writers and seriously by its readers. And uh, I think of it as not escapism. I think of it as an important tool in the cultural landscape for critique of the way things are and for exploration of the way things might be. Well, that that uh, raises a, a really interesting point, uh, Robert. If you because you are a professional writer who has been writing science fiction for uh, quite a while, um, if you want to be a successful author who writes the uh, the kinds of things that challenge and that can change the world, uh, your words. Um, but what you're writing is not popular at the moment. Um, how does the writer? Uh, put forth things that the readers don't necessarily want to hear um, and have enough of an audience to get the message out. D- does that make sense? Sure, it makes sense. The difficulty is, sadly, that almost every one of the big five, all of the big five traditional publishers, is driven by the bestseller now. Uh, it used to be uh, that uh, a publishing company would, of course, everybody would love to have a Dan Brown or a, a Fifty Shades of Grey, at least in terms of uh, the sales. But they would also publish quieter novels, novels that they felt were important, of literary merit or of merit as social comment uh, or what have you. And that seems to be falling by the wayside a great deal. So what we need is disintermediation. We have too much of a handful of gatekeepers, five big New York publishers deciding – what should be published based on what will sell the most rather than what is the most important thing to uh, to put our imprint on. And we need to pay, as people do now, more attention to uh, social media, more attention to Goodreads, more attention to places where readers are actually talking about books that excite them rather than publishers looking to cater to the lowest common denominator. It's an uphill battle, though. There are many fine authors who write brilliant works who sadly have a negligible audience. Some of that they can rectify. I have some very good friends who are very talented who truly shy away from any uh, 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 public appearances, doing a podcast like this, anything that is uh, even remotely interfacing with the public. I, on the other hand, am comfortable with that 
and have found it very salutary in terms of uh, promoting sales of my work. Well, sure. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's definitely um, uh, the, the onus is on the, the author now to do promotion. Uh, we uh, we work with a lot of publishers and scheduling guests for the show uh, and that and, and I, I find it uh, more times than not that I'm interfacing with the authors directly uh, because the you know, the the. Uh, I don't know. The, the publishers don't have the staff anymore. I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, it's just that the manpower is not there. So the, the author is required to, to do all that work. And if you're not out there interfacing with your, with your audience, you're, then you're probably not selling books and, and you're not understanding what the, what the market is anymore. Exactly. And you're right. I mean, a publishing company, well, my current U.S. publisher, it was a division of Penguin Random House, one of their science fiction and fantasy imprints called Ace, Ace, A-C-E. So they do six titles a month, every month, 72 books a year. And they have a couple of publicists who are responsible for them. Well, in that first month, a book is out. Those six new titles get a lot of attention. In the second month, maybe some attention still. By the third month, uh uh-uh, there's already six and 12 new titles from one month and two months after yours that are out that uh, that have to be their focus. Uh, and so for a book to have any long-term footprint, uh, it, the author has to take a very, very serious role in, uh, in being the advocate for that book once it is out. The publicist's job is over pretty much 30 days after the book is out. We want, obviously, to be finding readers months, years, and decades after our books came out. Said I've been at this a long time. My first book came out 28 years ago, and people are still reading it, Golden Fleece. Uh, I want people to still read it. I want them to read it for decades to come. Well, and and that's one of the beautiful things about science fiction is that uh, the a lot of great science fiction classics do have a long shelf life, uh, as opposed to maybe a military thriller that is kind of dissecting the the headlines of today. Um, a great science fiction story uh, maybe is projecting far enough into the future, or maybe is is dealing with um, uh, some more. Uh, you know, uh, things about the human condition that that uh, that tend to have a longer shelf life. Uh, that's a, another great thing about science fiction. Yes, absolutely. When you're dealing with cosmic themes or themes about the fundamental nature of reality and what it means to be human, you're writing for the ages. If you write a, well, you mentioned the Cold War, right? You write a Cold War thriller, well... The Cold War is over, right? People are more interested in a thriller now that involves uh, North Korea as a rogue nuclear power. But if we're lucky, six months from now, they will have uh, stepped down from being that and will be, you know, stories get dated. So absolutely, science fiction uh, can have an enormously long shelf life. In fact, right now I'm reading it. I probably should have read it ages ago. But I'm reading Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith. I'd never read uh, it and uh, it's uh, a hu- it's ninety years old now, I guess ninety years old. And I just finished rereading for the umpteenth time the Time Machine by H. G. Wells. Well, that came out a hundred and twenty three years ago in eighteen ninety five, and still is a remarkably good read. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, the, a, a few years ago, uh, of course, there was the, the blockbuster film series uh, based on the, the Jason Bourne books. Yes. Uh, and, and they, they uh, updated the movies quite a bit. Uh, if you pick up one of those books, the original uh, Ludlum books uh, on that series and try to read it now, they are horribly outdated, uh, you know, written in the 70s. Mm. Uh, and they just do not age well. You know, he, he's going into a phone booth and, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, f- phone freaking and stuff that yes. nobody would ever do. Yes. They just they do not age well. Um, but you know, you, you pick up the time machine, like you said, and it's just it's absolutely readable. Um, you, you mentioned H.G. Wells, and, and we talked about Ray Bradbury earlier, and they were um, very. Uh, very much in in favor of of writing science fiction 
with heavy metaphor. Um, do you think that science fiction is best served when couched in metaphor, or do you think that uh, that the science fiction writer can can talk directly to the reader? And and I know you've done both, uh, but kind of how do you fall there on the 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 metaphor versus uh, kind of street story? Sure. So there, it's a tricky issue because originally science fiction had two reasons why it would talk in terms of metaphor. Uh, or a disguise or a mask about what they were talking about. Reason one was because there were certain topics that you simply could not talk about in polite company. And reason two was because there were people who would be resistant to engaging in a discussion of something you wanted them to hear, but you could sneak up on it. So, for instance, H. G. Wells, anybody could have talked about the British class system, which is what War of the Worlds is actually about. There was no, it wasn't verboten to say, oh, you know, there's a, in fact, everybody would say, oh, not for the likes of us, Gov, or uh, that toffee nose git over there. Or, uh, you know, people were very conscious of class. They still are to some substantial degree that we North Americans don't really understand in Great Britain. They're still conscious of it. Um, you could talk about it, but could you get people to engage with an issue that Wells wanted them to engage with, which was, not only is the class system bad for the lower classes, which it, you know, undeniably is. They don't have much food. They don't have much education. But it's bad for the upper class, too. The working class, of course, has a rough time. But so does the leisure class. That was the message of uh, the time machine, that by not doing any hard work yourself, not doing any hard thinking yourself, you're going to stagnate and uh, become utterly feckless. So he didn't have to, it wasn't a topic that he couldn't approach, but it was a topic with the message that he couldn't say, here's a book about why the upper class uh, is actually in danger, right? That they're actually stupid to insist on this this class uh, system that we have. The Today, most topics we can talk about directly. There was a time where you couldn't talk about abortion or even divorce. Uh, you know, or child abuse. Uh, and now they're sadly, uh, in many cases, mainstream uh, news stories all the time, a plus or minus or, you know, an abortion clinic is bombed or something. So there are not many topics that you can't open a dialogue about these days. But still that value of saying, OK, I'm going to show you a story about this, but it's really about that. And you would not be open to reading about that. But I can get you to read about this. I can get you to read about the future. I can get you to read about aliens. I can get you to read about dinosaurs. I can get you to read about uh, robots. When I'm really talking about race relations or the abortion issue or the Catholic Church's failure to engage with the uh, uh, the child abuse crisis uh, within their walls, you know, and I don't want to read about that. Oh, but if I couch it and by the time you're halfway in and engaged by the characters, you go, oh, wow, okay, I see the parallel. That's the value of it. And I think it still and always will have that value. Sure, sure. Um, how did you get started uh, publishing? Your first book was called Golden Fleece. Um, did you did you immediately start writing novels uh, or did you start kind of the more traditional science fiction route of, of writing short stories and, and getting those published? Kind of what was your entree? Yeah, definitely the latter. And I would say even to this day, about three quarters of the professionally published science fiction writers – do it the way I did. You start by writing short stories and then you quote unquote graduate to writing novels. Um, part of the reason is that uh, short stories, of course, are a tractable project. You can finish one. A short story is not going to take more than a, a couple of weeks at the outside, right? It's something that you can get done and you learn by seeing a story's beginning, middle, and end, right? You learn how to do it. A novel is a very hard thing to keep under control um, and to learn to plot. It's a lot easier to learn to plot or do a character arc in a small space to begin with. There's that value. Two, in science fiction and fantasy, there have long been uh, short fiction markets that are constantly hungry for new talent. Why are they hungry for new talent? They don't pay very well. So the old farts don't write for them very often anymore. If you can make 10 times as much writing a 5,000 word chapter of a novel as you can writing a 5,000 word short story, 
which are you going to do? Well, you're going to do the novel, right? So established writers don't do a lot of short fiction. There's a hunger. There's a way to break in. The third reason is it's really hard to interest an agent or a publisher in reading your manuscript. You say, I've written a novel. Yeah, lots of people have written a novel. And it's really good. Yeah, well, you're saying it. Of course, you're biased. You think it's really good. And I've been published in Analog, Science Fiction Magazine, or the Canadian On Spec, or the British Interzone. And they, oh, well, I know those magazines. So they have good standards. And if you've managed to sell to them, all right, maybe I should have a look at your novel. So it's a very effective way of getting your foot in the door. That said, I said three quarters of uh, the pros I know did it that way. Means the other third. Uh, so, <laughs> there's my hard SF math. <laughs> the other quarter, the other quarter uh, did it the other way, which is dive in with both feet and do a novel. Often you'll find that it took them five years to sell that first novel just to get somebody to get around to reading it. At Tor, uh, which was my publisher for ten years and is still the largest English language science fiction publisher, the average response time to an unsolicited manuscript, they'll take them, you can send it in, it's three years, three years before it works its way up to the top of the 2B red pile and then gets, if you're lucky, 20 minutes of an editor's attention to make a good impression. Now, if it makes a good impression in that first 20 minutes of looking through it, okay, they'll go ahead and read the the uh, the whole book, but you may have waited three years to have somebody just not be engaged by your first chapter and send it back at that point. So it is actually probably a faster route as well to start with short fiction because you go into the novel game as a published writer and have that uh, that power. Do, do you think there's a market for uh, for short fiction writers uh, anymore? I, I, I know that a lot of those markets are, are drying up, but but there are some uh, some that are uh, that are still uh, pretty prominent. We we mentioned uh, several of them, uh, but with the the change in the publishing landscape and uh, self publishing becoming more of a uh, dominant factor uh, and uh, the, the ability for authors to go directly to an audience. Do you see uh, short fiction making any sort of a resurgence in that space? Well, you know, it's interesting uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, there were so many science fiction magazines. They were literally letting kids edit them. I just finished reading Damon Knight's uh, book, The Futurians, which is a history of a group of science fiction geeky teenagers who lived uh, communally in New York City. And, you know, in the in the 1940s and they would uh, and 50s and they would, uh, you know, at 19 be given the editorship of a science fiction magazine because there was so much demand. There were so many of these magazines. Now we're down in print to a very small number. There's Galaxy's Edge, which I'm a columnist for, Analog, Asimov's, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. In the United States, that's about it for ones that come out in print. There are a number of good online ones. Uh, Lightspeed is a very good one, uh, for instance. Uh, Clark's World is a very good one, for instance. But you're right. There isn't anywhere near the marketplace there was in the heyday for short fiction. Now, you can indeed self-publish and go straight to your audience. The problem is you're not alone in trying to do that. There are tens of thousands of wannabe science fiction writers putting their novels out there. And if you don't gain an audience, what do you do? You know, your novel comes out and eight people buy it or 25 people or even 100 people buy it. It's not going to be your parlay into a um, – you're not going to be able to parlay that into uh, a publishing contract with a major publisher. Say you're self-published and you've sold 100,000 copies. They'll pay attention. Say you're self-published and you've sold 1,000 copies. They may say, well, that's probably the entire market in the whole world for your particular story. So it's a, it's a bit of a gamble as a route to a traditional publishing contract, and it's uh, – you know. On the other hand, it's wide open, uh, and you can become – there are the Hugh Howies of the world uh, who are self-published and remain self-published because it's way more lucrative for them uh, than anything they would get in terms of a traditional publishing contract. Yeah. 
it, it's a really interesting time that that the author uh, finally has options, even though th- those options are, are changing. Uh, but maybe maybe one project is better served by self-publishing uh, like yes. you would do. And, and maybe another project uh, needs to go to Harper and uh, maybe Tor is the right fit for another or, well, you know, it's a, it's an interesting time. Yeah, you know, there actually is even a formula for what's going to be successful. The romance writers were the first to discover this. Still, the biggest categories of self-published fiction are romance and erotica. Now, what do those two things have in common? One is you know what you're getting when you buy it. If you buy a romance, it's very clear in the packaging of the romance if it's a modern, sophisticated a career woman who has sex outside of marriage, or it's a prim and proper uh, girl in the uh, 15, sorry, in the 1900s, you know, a Regency romance, whatever it is. You know exactly what the product is. And in erotica, you know, whether it's gay or whether it's straight or blah, blah, blah. You know what you're getting. One. Two, the works are almost never reread. They're read once and are disposable. Three, the readers of those works read them voraciously. It's not at all unusual unusual to have a romance reader who does a novel a day in terms of reading. Um, and erotica, again, a, a story a day or so forth. So the writers who do best uh, in science fiction are the same, following the same footsteps as the romance and erotica writers. They are super prolific. Three, four, five, six books a year they're putting out. The books tend to be short. They're not even, you know, uh, my contracts usually specify for a traditional publisher between 100 and 125,000 words, which is double the length a science fiction novel was in the 1960s. A 50 to 60,000 word was very standard length. And a lot of self-published novels are 40 to 60,000 words, much shorter than would work in print. But they're published uh, in profusion, the authors, as I said, will do many titles. It's exactly clear what you're getting. It's this ongoing military SF series or first contact series or whatever it is. Uh, you're feeding the same market over and over again with essentially the same product again and again and again. That works. What I do, I take a year, sometimes my most recent book, three years to write a book. My friend Kim Stanley Robinson takes several years to write a book. My friend David Brin was 10 years between books that his most recent existence was 150,000 words, gigantic book. These aren't things that you can bring to market every 90 or 120 or 180 days. You can't feed that beast. They're books that are read slowly. And we like to think that our readers will find them rewarding to read a second and third time. And that's a very tough thing to do in the self-publishing marketplace. It does not reward that kind of writing very often. Well, do you feel like, uh, Robert, that there's ever um, – how, how do I say this? Um, we, we talked earlier about science fiction challenging the reader and that we, we definitely want books that they, uh, that a, a reader kind of lingers over and uh, takes time to let, uh, let the story soak in, uh, let the characters become alive, let the, the metaphor that we talked about really take root. Uh, and then there are other books that we kind of burn through. We, we read through them like you were just talking about the, the, the stories that we, we know ahead of time what the story is that we're getting and, uh, and it's pure entertainment. Um, can, did those two things ever converge and, uh, should a science fiction writer ever be worried, uh, that, you know, I'm just writing entertainment. Um, like is, is just writing entertainment always bad. So I'm not trying to make a judgment, uh, a value judgment here. Of course, of course not. This is Uh, your opinion. No, no, no. But uh, seriously, when I say I write a certain kind of book, I do. And I have a certain kind of reader. I have friends, very good friends, who write the other kind of book. And they have a certain kind of reader. And uh, we're, all of us, serious about what we do. All of us are uh, craftspeople when it comes to our prose All of us care deeply about giving value for money to our readers. So in that sense, uh, there's nothing at all wrong with that. But there is, you know, I mean, in a broad sense, there's a fundamental dichotomy between the Star Wars fan, which is space opera, action adventure, fantasy dressed up as sci-fi, 
and the Star Trek fan, which in its best incan- uh, incarnations, which we haven't seen much of lately, is social commentary and is, you know, exploration of ideas. There's certainly a place for both. And there's no question that the public decided they actually like Star Wars better than they like Star Trek. I have to accept that reality that more people would love to see a rollicking action adventure than have a thoughtful discussion about the place of man and woman in the cosmos. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And, and, and it's, it's really sad uh, in some cases. And, and sometimes you just want a popcorn uh, movie or, or story, uh, but we still need those things that challenge us. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I hope that we're not losing one, uh, just because the other is kind of dominating the, the the marketplace. Right, and I hope that's the case too. See, the thing is, publishers, like if I take three years to write a book or I take one year to write a book or my friend Kevin J. Anderson takes three months to write a book, the publisher doesn't care. Publisher doesn't say, okay, how many hours did Rob put in? How many hours did Kevin put in? Well, Rob's hourly rate should be this and Kevin's should be that and work out it. No, they say, how many copies will it sell? That's the only thing that matters. So assuming that Kevin and I, let's just say that Kevin and I are are worth the same amount of money per hour. If we teach or if we uh, edit or do something else, that isn't applicable when we write. I spend more uh, time writing a book than Kevin does. Uh, Kevin's books sell better in many cases than mine do. The publisher is going to give Kevin... Uh, and me, if I'm lucky, comparable advances. And if I'm unlucky, they're going to give Kevin a bigger advance than me and a bigger push than me because uh, the book is going to sell. They simply do not care. There's nothing in the reward structure to reward a David Brin who takes 10 years to write Existence or a Rob Sawyer who takes three years to write Quantum Night or a, uh, a Kim Stanley Robinson who takes uh, you know five years to write Red Mars. There's nothing to reward it, except if the book actually finds a marketplace and takes off of its own volition. Well, speaking of, uh, you said it takes, uh, Quantum Night took three years to write. What is your your process like uh, when you begin a book? Do you have an idea ahead of time uh, and, and then research it? Or are you just kind of always collecting information and a, a story comes out of that? So I'm a top-down writer. I come up with a topic that I want to explore. We, we spoke a little bit earlier, Hank, about the fact that I'm basically an optimistic writer, optimistic to the point that some reviewers had said, particularly after my trilogy Wake, Watch, and Wonder about the World Wide Web gaining consciousness, that maybe I was almost Pollyanna-ish, utopianly uh, cheerful about the future. And I thought, well, that's not really true. I don't think that's fair. But nonetheless... It's true that I haven't engaged with the dark side of humanity. So, okay, what's my topic going to be for my next book? All right, I'm going to write a book about evil. That's my topic. I'm a science fiction writer. So my first question is, what science is there of evil? Is there any science of evil? There's lots of fantasy and mythology about evil, but is there any science? Well, lo and behold, as soon as you put that into Google, you find psychopathy, the study of psychopaths. You find... uh, Uh, Stanley Milgram and the obedience to authority experiments. Um, You find uh, the uh, Stanford prison guard experiment of uh, Philip Zimbardo. You find all kinds of science related to evil. So I spent an entire year researching that. And then I came out of that with a thematic statement. And my thematic statement was this. The most pernicious lie humanity has ever told itself is that you can't change human nature. We use that as the great excuse for evil. Well, what are you going to do? People are going to be bad. People, bad things are going to happen. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. And I decided, no, if you're going to tackle evil head on, you have to tackle, can we change evil people into not evil people? And out of that developed a, a character who was an experimental psychologist, a plot, with him discovering that in his own past he had forgotten a six-month period when he possibly had done horrendously evil things himself, and a story, and it develops that way over a period of time. But I spent, before I wrote Word One, an entire year doing nothing but 40-hour weeks of researching the science of evil before I sat down to write the book. 
and uh, and and you worked on it for for three years. Uh, what is the what did you um, what was the story that came out of that? Uh, because it 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 became uh, oddly prescient uh, this last. It did. Uh, it did. <laughs> uh, you know what I, I mentioned uh, way at the beginning of the interview. My mother taught statistics, right? And so I'm very attuned to when I see a bad statistic. And one of the statistics I kept seeing was that maybe two to three percent of the population suffers from psychopathy, are psychopaths, two to three percent. Why is that the case? Said uh, I looked at the research. Well, because two to three percent of the prison population is psychopaths. Well, you know what? Ninety five percent of the prison population is male. Do we say that 95% of the general population is male? No, it's 50% male, 50% female. Clearly, there's a selection bias. Which criminals are least likely to go to jail? Well, in fact, it's the psychopaths. One of the traits of psychopathy is glibness. Another trait of psychopathy is uh, is uh, um, the ability to lie to people's faces with no tells, not giving any indication. So, of course, they get away with crimes disproportionately. And I came to realize that there are probably way more psychopaths in society than has been generally recognized because of this ridiculous statistic that's quoted in book after book based on surveys of the prison population as as if it was indicative. Um, And I thought, you know, we're veering towards having a psychopath as president of the United States. I wrote this book before Trump was even a candidate. But now there are you know, a lot of people who look at Trump and the standard definition of psychopathy, which is being utterly devoid of empathy, and see it very clearly in his both public and private actions. Uh, and so I ended up writing a novel in which uh, a psychopath became president of the United States. And lo and behold, there arguably is one at the moment. And I think, as you say, it was quite prescient and got a lot of attention because of that. Do you ever worry about uh, writing uh, something that is uh, almost immediately challengeable? Uh, like, like, and, and of course, you didn't plan this book that way, uh, but the book became part of the conversation uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, because of the topics we're just talking about. Do, do you ever worry um, about uh, writing things that will that, that cut a little too close to the quick? No, exactly the opposite. I'm a firm believer that science fiction is relevant, that it's not escapist, that it's important, that it has things to say that are on target with what's going on in the world right now. And the only way to make that point is for periodically, at least, to have science fiction works that are set in the here and now or the very near future so that they can directly engage. It's all well and good for H.G. Wells to write about the year 802-701 A.D., 800,000 years in the future, as he did in The Time Machine. But there are times when you want to write a book that's published in 2018 and set in 2018 so that you can say, look, this science fictional mindset, this asking how we got to where we are and where we might go next based on extrapolating that trend forward is valuable in terms of our discourse on social topics. And I'm fully prepared for people to want to argue with me. That's part of the joy of a good science fiction book. I'm not trying to convert people to my way of thinking. I'm trying to get them to examine their own preconceptions and think better about every issue that they encounter in their life. Um, Robert, you, you mentioned earlier that you have been uh, writing for, for 28 years or so. Well, as a novelist, uh, 30, 30, as a novelist, 38 is a short story writer. Wow. Um, you know, Writing is one of the oldest uh, art forms and uh, one of the oldest uh, careers uh, that that folks uh, endeavor to. And with that comes uh, tools that people use to uh, to uh, ply their art and, and ply their trade. And you know, writers are are 
always uh, kind of geeking out about new technology and and new ways of doing things for for an art form that's at its core pretty simple. You know, it's putting words on a page, mm-hmm. uh, and and we could do it with you know with a, a legal pad and a pen. Um, but you know, new software comes out and and things like that, and and a lot of times writers will get very distracted uh, by the new shiny tool. Uh, that you know increases productivity and, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, you very famously uh, write with an old DOS word processor, uh, WordStar uh, 4.0, I think no, it no. is. Uh, I, George R. R. Martin uses 4.0. I George is a primitive man. I, I George is is a Homo erectus, whereas I I sir am a Homo sapien. I do uh, uh, four uh, seven actually WordStar seven, oh, which was the final version. <laughs> Excellent. Um. Is there a is there a reason for uh, for finding a tool and staying there and and not chasing uh, you know the new thing? Uh, is it just comfort for you, or do you find uh, that the the constant uh, you know software upgrading and chasing the newest thing that actually is is distracting to the art? I, it's not that WordStar was the last word processing program that was really constructed from the ground up for creative composition at the keyboard. Every subsequent program, including even things like Scrivener, which are dedicated, uh, and also uh, uh, Final Draft, uh, which is the most popular screenwriting program, are based on the model that was developed for Microsoft Word, which is a model ultimately designed for secretarial work. It was designed for top-down composition uh, rather than flying all over different places in a document. Uh, Word slows you down constantly to do basic functionality. You have to take your hands off the home typing row to use arrow keys, which may be in one position on your laptop and another position on your desktop. You have to constantly reach for a mouse or a trackpad, click a button to accomplish things. On WordStar, you do every single command, editing and composing with your fingers firmly planted on the home typing row. Uh, And that makes the distinction. It's not a modal word processor. Word is you're either typing or you're editing. Your fingers are either on the home writing, uh, uh, the home row, or they're on arrow keys or a mouse, but they're not on the home row again. In fact, Word says once you've marked a block, lo be woe betide you if you want to change something in that block. What happens if you start typing when a block is marked in Word or Scrivener or Final Draft? It replaces your marked block. In WordStar, I can mark a block and say, oh, my God, but that word in the middle of the block, that shouldn't have been uh, Canada. It should have been Croatia, Croatia. And I go and I change it. The block is still blocked. I can do whatever I want with it. WordStar is a very, very effective tool. Put in my last name, Sawyer, and WordStar into Google. You'll find my essay on why I, and as I say, George R. R. Martin, too, continue to swear by it. It is the least intrusive writing tool you will ever find in terms of getting the thoughts, which for a creative writer are fleeting, evanescent. They evaporate like dew in the morning sun. Uh, And you have to get them off uh, onto the page so incredibly quickly. Uh, WordStar helps Word and any word processor that's basically built on that paradigm hinders that process. Uh, Quantum Night is your latest book. Uh, Robert, what are you working on these days? <coughs> Excuse me. I've just started my – well, I haven't just started. I, I'm well into the research and the planning of my 24th novel, which will be an alternate history about the Manhattan Project. And I'm hoping it will come out uh, actually uh, in 2020, two years from now, uh, which is the 75th anniversary of the actual Manhattan Project. So – Part of the thing I would say to any writer is always be thinking about, you know, how your book is going to be promoted. And the answer is a good anniversary like that is always a good tie in for something. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the Manhattan Project uh, has not been written about enough. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to see what you do with it. Yeah, you know, my friend Gregory Benford, great science fiction writer, just recently had a book come out called The Berlin Project, which was about, in fact, not the Manhattan Project, or not uh, Los Alamos, Oppenheimer. None of that happened in his alternate history. It was a different uh, attempt 
at making an atomic bomb using a different uh, technology than what was actually used to uh, to uh, purify the uranium that was needed to get the uranium-235 that was needed, separated from the uranium-238. Um, but I'm writing a book where the main characters are those incredible larger-than-life figures, Edward Teller. Robert Oppenheimer, Leo Zillard, Enrico Fermi, uh, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, these characters, uh, uh, Albert Einstein, the greatest scientists of the 20th century. And that's going to be the joy of the book is having them having, let's say, continuing adventures. I can't wait to read it. Uh, We'll look forward to that uh, on the the uh the anniversary uh robert if people are uh maybe not familiar with your work and want to get plugged in with what you do where can they find you on the web well i was the first science fiction writer to have a website so i've got a great url it's sfwriter.com sf like science fiction check me out there or just run my name together without any punctuation robert j sawyer on twitter and facebook and you'll find me both those places Excellent. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hank, my pleasure. And congratulations on 300 episodes. That's a fabulous achievement. Uh, Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Didn't your dad teach you not to trespass? Yeah. Sorry, I'll go. Joey stepped forward, but Hedwick remained motionless, blocking the only exit. No, 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 no. Someone needs to learn a lesson about respecting other people's property. Joey felt unnerved and panicky. Please, Hedwick. Mr. Van Brunt. Please, Mr. Van Brunt. May I go now? Please? Not such a smartass now, are you? His voice grew flat and contemptuous. You little bastards think you run the world. But you have no idea. No idea where your food comes from. What your parents have to go through to put clothes on your back. Humiliating jobs. Long hours. Going gray. To provide for you. What are you talking about? Life. Real life. You think it's easy, don't you? Don't you? Those stupid adults doing their stupid adult things while you play all day. Well, it's hard. You hear me? It's hard. Joey's breath caught. He knew what Hedwig was capable of. What did you do to Jason? Nothing. Where is he then? Jason's run away from home. I don't believe you. I don't care what you believe. I'm the adult. I ask the questions. What did you do to my son? To Zeph? Is Zeph okay? No. He's not. Zeph is not okay. And it was you, wasn't it? You're the one who did it. Who did what? Who twisted his mind. I haven't done anything to Zeph. Don't lie to me! Hedwig raised a hand, and a fireball blossomed there. Joey had never seen Hedwig's gift before. The man held a piece of hell. His face looked like something carved from driftwood, full of cracks and crevices. His eyes were shadowed and vacant, but glittering with flame, like knotholes full of fireflies. Yeah, someone's mind had twisted, but not Zeph's. Hedwig's gone batshit. Hedwig passed the fireball from one hand to the other. Did Zeph send you for his things? I know you know where he is. He said... He said he was in love with you. Hedwig made it sound as if Zeph had confessed to murder. Is that true? I don't know. Hedwig broke into a wide grin. Well, we can find out, can't we? He's a pension, right? A pension would know. Know what? You're not making sense. It's their gift. The pension gift. My son's a pension, like his whore of a mother. And pensions are telepaths. 
They always know when the people they love are in danger. Joey's eyes had gone wide. He blinked, trying to process the information. Zeph had a gift? For sure? They have a psychic alarm. If you hurt someone they love, they come running. He raised the fireball. So let's find out. Let's find out if Zeph really loves you. Let's see if he's a fag or not. I know he's not. You'll see. He won't feel a thing when I do it. When you do what? When I burn you black. Joey went cold. Hedwick meant it. <laughs>